Thanks, Mark, for this uh, introduction, which I'm sure I don't deserve. But um, uh, I guess uh, a few of you uh, know about Lebanon. I can see uh, some from Syria and uh, other neighboring countries, but uh, probably the most of you don't know a lot about Lebanon. So I thought I'd start by giving you uh, a snapshot of some few interesting facts about uh, Lebanon. Lebanon, uh, for those who know it, do not know it, is a lively, cheery, and enthusiastic country with rich culture and diversified heritage, and 18 religious communities and many ethnicities. This is why the late Pope John Paul II uh, said when he visited Lebanon, I think it was 1997, that Lebanon is not only a country, it is also a message. Indeed, it's a message to the world representing a unique social mosaic. Lebanon is the first Arab country that had the constitution and the first democracy. Lebanon was occupied by over 15 countries, civilizations, groups, name them what you want, um, including the Egyptians, Hittites, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Alexander the Great, um, Roman Empire, uh, Crusaders, uh, Britain, France, and so on. Um, but uh, eventually, uh, uh, Lebanon went back to the Lebanese. The word Lebanon, originated from the Semitic root Liban, which means white, signifying the white peaks, which is uh, the mountains of uh, Lebanon. The country's name is known to be the oldest in the world and has remained unchanged for over 4,000 years. It appears 75 times in the Old Testament. There are four out of 20th of the 20th oldest cities in the world are Lebanese. Um, the name Lebanon appears many times in the Bible. The name Cedar, Lebanon's tree, which is what appears on the Lebanese flags, appears 75 times in the Old Testament. Um, Beirut, the capital of Lebanon, was destroyed and rebuilt seven times. This is why it's compared to the Phoenix. This is why when you dig anywhere in Beirut, you find remains of different cultures, different civilizations. It's the 10th most popular shopping destination in the world. It's named World Book Capital in 2009. Byblos, a city in Lebanon, is the oldest continuously living city in the world. The first alphabet was created by Qadmus in Byblos. The name of Byblos appears in the Bible many times. Phoenicians, original people of Lebanon, thousands of years ago, built the first boats from cedar, and they were the first to sail across the world the first to develop the alphabet in 1100 BC to facilitate their prosperous trade, the first to explore the coasts of West Africa and Britain in 1000 BC, and they reached America long before Christopher Columbus did. With respect to geography, Lebanon is the only Arab and Asian country that has absolutely no desert. In springtime and on the same day, you can ski in the mountains and or swim in the sea. There are 15 rivers in Lebanon, all of them coming from its own mountains. Lebanon is one of the most populated countries in its archaeological sites in the world. As far as education, the first school of law in the world was built in Lebanon in downtown Beirut, what used to be Beirut hundreds of years ago. It has 46 universities and higher education institutions, and most Lebanese are trilingual, Arabic, French, and English. Over 70% of the over 1 million K-12 students are in private schools, which is again unique for Lebanon. Most, most countries, not just in the region, across the world, it's the other way around. 70 to 90% are in public uh, education, public schools. As far as the population, there are 4.5 million Lebanese in Lebanon, almost 50% in the capital, and over 20 million Lebanese outside Lebanon in every country of the world. There's one doctor per 10 persons in Lebanon. In Europe and America, the ratio is one to 100. As far as religion, almost 40% of the Lebanese people are Christians. This is the highest percentage in the region. The only remaining temple of Jupiter, the main Roman god, is in Baalbek, Lebanon, what's called the city of the sun. According to Christ Christianity, Jesus Christ made his first miracle turning water into wine in a place called Qana, near Sidon in Lebanon, towards the south. 
People say that the cedars were planted by God's own hands. This is why they're called the cedars of God. And this is why Lebanon is called God's country on earth. King Solomon temple was built with Lebanon cedar. At 3,088 meters above sea level, Qurnet al Sauda is the highest peak in Lebanon. According to medieval religious literature, Noah planted a tree in the summit of Mount Lebanon, Qurnet al Sauda. With respect to culture, Lebanon is the country that has the most books written about it in the world. Lebanon, which represents 2.5% of the total area of the Arabic peninsula, produces 70% of the publications in the Arab world. In business and trade, we have 40 daily newspapers, a small country like that. It has over 100 banks, I'm talking banks, not branches, in the same country. It's a, the second richest man in the world comes from Lebanon, the Lebanese descent, Carlos Slim, you all heard of him. Lebanon is known to have the highest gold reserve in the Middle East. As far as innovators and um, inventors across the globe, there are hundreds of names, to, to name a few. The creators of Tom and Jerry are originally Lebanese, Joseph Barbara and William Hanna. The creator and the production manager of the iPod is originally Lebanese, Tony Fadel. The Lebanese, Hassan Kamil al Sabah, was a technological leader whose inventions in electricity had a great impact on the development of the 20th century technology, and he was the first one who was working on creating electricity from sunlight. He passed away when he was very young, 60, 70 years ago. So you look at a snapshot of Lebanon, it really is a real crime against humanity to destroy a country with such a beauty, history, and legacy. Um, before I start my talk, I want to sort of fine tune uh, in terms of, because it's related, in terms of the achievements uh, during my term as Minister of the Ministry of Education and Higher Education. So again, I'll give a quick snapshot of uh, some of the achievements. In the, in the area of general achievements, uh, introduced an elaborate education and higher education sector strategic plan. Uh, that includes, for the first time, the three types of education, not just basic education, but also higher education and vocational and technical education. This is a ministry that includes all three components, used to be three ministries up to, I think, 2001, and uh, happens to be three ministries in many other countries in the region and across the world. Implemented business leadership programs in vocational and technical education for the first time in the Middle East uh, in pre-university education. Introduce an IT literacy plan for the ministry's workforce. That's teachers, directors, employees, administrative staff. Some of the achievements in the K-12 pre-university education issue and implement the community service degree. We will talk about it. Law regarding compulsory education and provision of free school books. Again, that's for the first time. Publish alternative plans for special needs education. It was completely ignored at the time. Um, as well as reproductive health, environment education, and school health. Organize schools and universities, sports clubs and unions. For the first time, schools now have uh, sports uh, clubs and sports unions. Uh, that was uh, a decree done uh, jointly with the Ministry of Youth and Sports. Define preschool over three years and issue relevant curricula. The curricula has not been touched for 16 years at the time. And we started, of course, bottom-up approach. So we started with the preschool, which used to be KG1, KG2. We turned it into three years, designed the curricula, produced the decree, and implemented it. Define preschool over three years and issue the relevant curricula. The, the, um, uh, the education in, in Lebanon is divided into, of course, preschool, now three years, elementary, middle school, and um, uh, high school. So elementary school is also two phases the first three years for which the curricula was also designed and the decree came out for it. And the second phase of, which is grades four to six, um, almost completed, but then the cabinet resigned and it, the thing propagated to the next cabinet. Um, provided a large number of interactive boards and, I, and you know many things in ICT and training in public schools. Drafted a strategic plan for the first time for ICT use in education and administration. And established several new public schools and high schools, something I think like 30, 40. 
uh, also signed several cooperation partnerships to support development activities that provided the ministry with almost $200 million, including the USAID, which was about $75 million, European Union, uh, UNICEF, and what have you. And they all uh, uh, had to do with uh, either uh, uh, issues related to infrastructures in schools or uh, programmatic or training to basically improve the overall condition of public schools. I might not have mentioned it, but uh, we have about 1,300 public schools in Lebanon. Um, and as I said, 70%, which is about 700,000 students in, in those public schools. Um, whereas we have uh, um, another 300,000 uh, in private schools with the same number of schools. So the student faculty ratio in, in the public schools is much lower than that in the private sector for obvious reasons, because the government has to open schools in very remote areas, which is obviously not going to be done by the private sector. In the higher education sector, uh, some of the achievements include draft law to create a national board on higher education for quality assurance, which was responsible for things like ensuring uh, institutional and uh, program accreditation at the university level. A draft law on the higher education directorate general structure. Uh, we opened tracks between higher education and vocational technical education. We issued a decree to regulate PhD programs uh, education in all uh, uh, private universities. Uh, we drafted a decree for licensing new medical schools and developed a new mechanism for colloquium exams. And finally, for vocational and technical education, some of the achievements include a decree to organize VTE, vocational and technical education fields, phases, and certificates. It was a specialty before. Um, issue a decree to organize the equivalence committee. Issue a decree to introduce VTE scholarships. Uh, I think there were 2,000 scholarships at the time. Review vocational and technical curriculum content to fit with new amendments and draft a decree to organize a credit-based post-secondary VTE, uh, again, to facilitate movement across from the VTE sector to the higher education sector. Somebody, uh, you know, the, the higher education, the VTE is, is, starts from grade nine up to bachelor equivalent. So, uh, you have uh, uh, the BETE, back technique, which is equivalent to grade 12 high school. And then it goes to TS, uh, uh, which is the first two years in higher education, followed by uh, LT, which is licence technique, which is equivalent to a bachelor uh, level. So those that uh, 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 complete a TS in, in a specialization can switch to university and continue a bachelor degree rather than go to an LT. That opened up things uh, and that... Uh, uh, sort of made the VTE sector more attractive uh, for students. So going back to the topic of uh, the talk, which is the importance of interreligious and intercultural uh, education, cultural and religious diversity constitutes one of the main characteristics of Lebanon's social mosaic and shapes the unifying, na the unifying national identity. Religious belonging plays an important role in forming the Lebanese citizen's personality and shaping his ideas or her ideas and behavior, in impacting relations among individuals and their public life. The Lebanese constitution reaffirmed the respect of the spiritual dimension and religious diversity by guaranteeing the freedom of belief and the state's respect to all religions and confessions. Hence, the constitution concludes by saying, no legitimacy to any authority which contradicts the coexistence pact. The Constitution considers religious plurality an integral part of the Lebanese social contract and ensures the freedom to express this plurality religiously and educationally. The wealth of this diversity and the interaction of its components became part of the common national culture such as the popular experience in coexistence, the management of public affairs, religious official holidays, common values, heritage, uh, religious tourism, and so on, which rendered Lebanon a model among other countries in building the national entity and unifying culture based on diversity and the will to coexist. This national reality is in conformity with international pacts. In fact, the World Declaration of the UNESCO on Cultural Diversity considers it a source of exchange, renewal and innovation, and deems its existence necessary for the human race. 
Therefore, it commended the policies fostering social cohesion and peace by ensuring every citizen's participation and interaction in a civil society, regardless of their belonging. In, this, in its report on education for the 21st century, the UNESCO states that education shall be a lifelong process with the need for living together and building relations with different individuals and groups as key objectives. Article 26 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights affirms that everyone has the right to education, highlighting the global education message aiming at developing the person's character, promoting rights and freedom, as well as understanding, tolerance, and friendship among all nations and ethnic or religious groups. Education on coexistence in Lebanon constitutes a natural and inevitable response to constitutional rules that form the national identity in conformity with international pacts and spiritual values that promote human development and civilization. It also provides young generations with the ability to live in a globalized world and growing relations and interaction among people. It also constitutes an important strategic objective to resolve the consequences of wars and internal conflicts of the last phase and the dangerous effects on the Lebanese society and cohesion and on citizens' belief in their nation and in others. In fact, the Lebanese society's memory is still fraught with images of confessional violence, population divide on confessional basis and deformed stereotypes on different religions, also abusing the citizens' religious feelings contributes to political and partisan mobilization, promoting closed confessional and sectarian mentalities, thereby spreading collective fanaticism at the expense of citizenship based on citizens' partnership and coexistence values. Accordingly, the importance of education on coexistence becomes evident and transgresses a matter of public religious education on the one hand, or education on citizenship from an individual and rights-based perspective on the other hand. It entails building youth capacity on treating religious diversity and understanding it in the special Lebanese context, being part of the common national heritage and one of the factors that reinforce the feeling of belonging to a unifying national entity. Education on coexistence also lies in developing common citizenship values that carry this cultural and religious diversity in highlighting its spiritual roots and global human dimensions to deter confessional mentalities and closed fanaticism. These education curricula rest on general principles with human and intellectual aspects that state the following. Belief and commitment to Lebanon, land of freedom, democracy, and justice consecrated in the Lebanese constitution and enshrined in laws. Belief and commitment to human values and principles that respect the human mind and call for education, work, and ethics. Awareness that Lebanon's spiritual heritage represented in monotheist religions is precious and shall be preserved and promoted as a model of spiritual and intellectual interaction and openness, given its contradiction with racial and religious discrimination, and commitment to the national culture while maintaining openness for global cultures, human values, and historical developments, knowing that this commitment is a positive contribution in developing and enriching these cultures. The above tackled faith and commitment to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and what this declaration represents in all fields, notably the respect of public freedom, mainly the freedom of opinion, as well as belief and respect of the individual and collective freedom. The general objectives of the curricula have also reaffirmed the need to build a citizen that is capable of assuming his or her role in the global society in general and in the Arab society in particular, able to understand his or her uniting national history to build a unified and open society away from small sectarian interests, focused on promoting public interests and respecting laws in line with the national pact, and working on building inner space and inner peace and peace among individuals, as well as in social and national relationships. In high school, where education and learning can actively influence convictions and positive orientations among learners, control and guide their practices, curricular objectives focused on allowing the learner to understand the essence of religions and their role in building the individual spiritual, ethical, and human 
personality, recognize the importance of ethical and human values and principles, respect others and establish the basis of coexistence, understand the meaning of rights and obligations and duly practice them, and comprehend Lebanon's position and realize the importance of gaining national culture emanating from the Lebanese and human heritage. The above shows the importance given by educational curricula to form the learner's intellectual, human, and national dimensions, and highlight the burden assumed by education to avert and prevent the danger resulting from rejecting the other with a different religion, race, color, land, or social status, especially that Lebanon, constituted of 18 different confessions from different religions, has suffered from religious turmoil in the last century of the past millennium that culminated in the most violent security problems between 19, 1975 and 1990. In fact, 13 April, only a few days ago, signifies the start of the Lebanese war in 1975. That's almost 40, well, it is 40 years ago. Further increasing this burden and the responsibility on the educational system is the regional situation from which the Lebanese society is unable to distance itself. Lebanon remains at the heart of the regional conflict and witnesses the daily and constant failure of the peace process in the Middle East, in spite of the relevant UN resolutions, in addition to the Iraqi sectarian crisis and bloodshed and its resulting immigration and dislodgement of its Christian population, and finally, the ongoing armed conflict in Syria and alignments resulting from religious and sectarian fighting. The aforementioned geopolitical crisis in the Middle East region, the spread and renewals of conflicts, the move of global, regional, and local economies towards increased austerity and aggravation, as well as the weak financial and material capabilities to implement new curricula and the difficulty to pursue procedures and measures imposed by the educational reform policy, led the Ministry of Education and Higher Education to approve, during my term in the office, a development plan with the citizenship education as one of its pillars and has taken several steps. One, approve the decree for the first time to execute the social service project in all high schools starting, that's public and private, starting 2013 and 14, aiming primarily at raising student aware, students' awareness on the importance of relations among Lebanese, build their personalities in order for their actions to complete their socially responsible behavior, equip them with methods to contemplate humanity problems and be involved in human cooperation frameworks to help in finding suitable solutions, develop positive attitude towards work, assistance and conscious treatment of others while respecting their rights, and encourage them to volunteer in social service in light of its benefits on his, her identity as a citizen and as a human being. Two, start a citizenship education project in collaboration with the European Union and obtain its buy-in to receive a grant to fund relevant activities aiming at building the boards of education, trainers, and students' capabilities on concepts related to modern citizenship education, review of school curricula and books, especially the civic, the civic and national education books, accompany relevant stakeholders in the review process, and prepare professional training and career development plans. Concerning the aforementioned project, I believe that citizenship education is the path towards social development and modernization, and that they cannot be achieved without the right to education, freedom of expression, equality, democracy, dignity, and tolerance. Education on citizenship helps prevent human rights violations and, constitu and constitutes an investment to build a fair society where all individuals are guaranteed appreciation and respect that raises awareness on the individual rights and responsibilities and ensures training on practicing them. In order to gain these skills, access should be provided to an educational course on the integration pedagogy, philosophy, by providing the student with knowledge, skills, and values, and aim at integrating them with the student's daily life by making positive actions towards him, her, society, and humanity. From the heart of citizenship education and believing in the role civil society organizations can play in shaping the image of the other, the ministry finalized partnerships with several organizations and institutions 
working in public schools to start activities that develop the three dimensions of citizenship, national belonging, civic participation and human partnership, and worked on the Citizenship Education for Religious Diversity project. During my term, the ministry celebrated the launch of the National Charter on Religious Diversity and Inclusive Citizenship Education that shall form the basis of approaching citizenship in its different dimensions through education and learning. Religious diversity and inclusive citizenship education is neither new nor strange in Lebanon, land of holiness and foothold of prophets and saints, which is famous for its spiritual and cultural wealth, and which constitution consecrated public freedoms and most importantly, the freedom of belief, practice of religious rights and respect for different opinions. In spite of this wealth that we have gained through our education, curricula and culture, we are facing nowadays the negative winds that blow in the world, impacting our Lebanese youth, and we are in dire need of rethinking religious diversity concepts and linking them to citizenship so that they remain a source of wealth and advancement instead of becoming a reason for division. In light of what was mentioned, a call for action and a unified front of solidarity is needed to bring together political and religious stakeholders, the international community and people of all faiths to confront and reject sectarian hate and violence. A successful example is the King Abdullah International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue, KAISID, the launching in Vienna a few years back I had attended, as its inclusive and dialogue approach to conflict resolution brings together all actors in a conflict zone, providing a safe space for mediation and negotiation. Extensive and indiscriminate violence in many parts of the world is displacing populations long established in those regions. The future of the people in, this region, in these regions is endangered, as has been the case in Iraq and Syria over the past three years. The coexistence between those different religious, religious communities and the richness of their contribution to civilization is at risk. Moreover, violent groups pretending to act in the name of religion presents a negative and violent image of the religion, causing a backlash, escalating tensions between people of different backgrounds. Finally, I would like to conclude by stating that the educational process is a lifelong process that starts with building the student as a global citizen and refining the required daily tasks as values and skills respect for others, belief in the principles of justice, equality and human respect, and adherence to coexistence are the cornerstone of this process that will not be complete without constant partnership with the public sector and civil society. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Luisa, I'm from Spain, and I wanted to ask about um, if, um, if they get, like, you were talking about education, about religious education, and if they get, um, yeah, religious education, I mean, they study the Bible or the Qumran, or they don't. And if you think that study will lead to respect for that religion, or just the opposite, like, um, yeah. Um, you see, everything is connected in the world and obviously in Lebanon. So when you want uh, to uh, pass a decree or a law that has to do with um, education um, and that affects certain uh, parts, major parts of the society, it is always turned politically. So um, uh, I have tried immensely to introduce a, a, a course on uh, understanding religions, a general course that can be um, offered to all schools. Uh, obviously, if it's a decree from, uh, from uh, the cabinet, then all schools would have to implement that. But to issue that, it means that the cabinet, the government, has to vote for it. The cabinet is obviously uh, composed from different political parties that are networked and correct, connected to the religious powers and what have you. So unless there's a will 
um, of all concerned to allow something like this to happen, it will not happen. I'm afraid we have not reached that stage yet. But what I'm suggesting is different. Uh, I'm suggesting um, uh, elements into our educational, introducing elements into our educational system in existing courses, civic education and, and uh, national education and what have you, um, uh, that would uh, help students uh, relate, that would, uh, uh, um, uh, from early young age, allow students to not to fear the other. The other could be different religion, different culture, different uh, ethnicity, different country, different color, whatever, yeah? And uh, uh, if, if this is done early on, we'd be dealing with a different graduate uh, that, uh, you know, uh, graduates not just as a, a Lebanese or as a Syrian or as a Jordanian or as a, any other nationality, but graduates as a global citizen that understands uh, you know, uh, the, the concept of coexistence with, with the other. Um, uh, and our educational systems across the region is really lacking, in my opinion. Um, and um, I mean, a simple example would be this. This is one of the major advantages in Lebanon. Our educational system is still ahead in the region. We have not kept up with uh, the latest, uh, uh, you know, globally, uh, we're lacking a lot, but if you compare with the region, it is, it is the best educational system, uh, but there's also much uh, lacking. So in the region, uh, if you look at uh, high school graduates, um, almost 90% in, in, without naming the countries, in regional countries, spend a year or two years uh, in a foundation program at university. So that's pre-freshman. Um, and the idea is to fill the gap that is there from the K to 12. So there's something, something seriously wrong in our K to 12 education system in the region. Um, um, and uh, obviously uh, in Lebanon, we also need, it's not the case in Lebanon, but we also need to continuously uh, update our curricula, curricula, which is not happening. So. When I became minister, the curricula had not been updated for, uh, I think, 12 or 14 years. Although there's a decree that says it has to be updated every four years, maximum of four years. But, you know, decrees are one thing and, uh, and implementation is another. So this is the situation in, in Lebanon and the region. Thank you. Hi, my name is Julia. I'm from Germany. Um, firstly, thanks for your talk. It was really interesting. And I have a question um, considering uh, access to schools and particularly higher education for girls. I know this is a problem for the region. I have no idea what the situation is like in Lebanon. But I was um, thinking about particularly rural areas, I guess, um, whether the numbers are getting more equal um, and what you might be doing to increase yeah, better right. access for girls. Right. No, it's not the case in Lebanon. Lebanon is... Um closer to what happens in Europe than what happens in other countries in the region. Uh, uh, actually, the number of female students is higher than the number of male students in, in schools and in universities. Uh, I know because uh, I've been a professor at uh, the American University of Beirut since 1985. I was five years old when I joined. But uh, anyway, um, uh, when you go to uh, graduation ceremonies, um, you find that uh, the number of female graduates uh, are, are more, and 70 to 80 percent that get distinction and high distinction are female. So they're not only more, they're more clever. So no, the situation in Lebanon is different, but um, there is a serious problem in the region very partially in Lebanon, but in the region, and that is, you know, the, re the population in the region is about 300, I'm talking the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, 22 Arab countries, is about 360 million, something like that. So uh, you have 90 million in Egypt and the rest distributed. So um, statistics say that almost a third are illiterate, you know, so that's 100 million almost that are illiterate. Uh, 60% uh, of those are female, you know, the woman that has to raise families and, uh, 
And uh, this is very serious because we're talking about illiteracy, not IT illiteracy, what the world is seeking now. You know, writing and, uh, and, and uh, uh, speaking your own language. So um, it's, it's a serious problem that has not been handled for decades. You don't reach a number like that in one or two years. This shows complete, uh, uh, you know, uncaring about this aspect for decades. Um, and this is a very serious matter, uh, in my opinion. No, Lebanon is a different story. Lebanon, uh, uh, being on the um, west uh, side of uh, Asia, has is, is always been the gate between east and west. And the uh, Lebanese themselves have always been travelers. So when you travel, you learn different cultures. You, I'm talking not hundreds of years, thousands of years, before Lebanon even from the Phoenicians' time. Uh, traveling is in their blood, it seems. Uh, so... Uh, it's a different story in Lebanon. Thank you. Uh, my name is Danilo, and I'm from Italy. And uh, I was in Lebanon for almost one year. I did my Erasmus Mundus at LAU first, and then I had the chance to do my master thesis at AUB. Uh, about, which department? Uh, climate change. Uh, no, which with, department? Uh, political science. But political I was, science. Yeah, ah. I was working with uh, Mr. Nadim Farajalla. Mm. about the management of water resources. Right. So yeah. I have many Lebanese friends, and what they told me is that uh, even though the educational system is, is very good, and uh, I saw it by myself, uh, they are forced to leave the country once they graduate. So how can the, what can the government and what can the Lebanese institutions do to keep this human capital in Lebanon? Yes, that's true. There's a huge brain drain in Lebanon. Uh, uh, the Lebanese uh, are one of the few societies that very strongly believe in education. Uh, the first thing we do when, when we get children is to do the impossible to give them the best possible education within our means. So uh, uh, it wouldn't be surprising for someone to sell his kidney to educate his uh, son or daughter this, to that extreme. So. Um, uh, uh, education is, is uh, the best thing you can give your children and your, your, uh, your youth. Um, um, we do have a good uh, higher education system. I mean, by comparison, if you like, because it's the same scale, if you, if you compare Lebanon with Sultanate of Oman, for example, we have a total of about 3,000 public and private schools. Uh, in Lebanon, which is about the same in Sultanate of Oman. But in Lebanon, at least 50% of them are good or very good or excellent. I'm sure in Oman it's much, much less than that, um, 10, 20 maybe. So uh, uh, we do have problems. Uh, we have serious problems. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, we have teachers that, not, that did not receive... Uh, 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 a salary raise for 14 years, 16 years. Uh, can imagine somebody uh, that uh, has not, uh, is unable to live with his salary, you know, uh, having to teach day after day. There are many problems in our education system, uh, definitely. But when, um, you know, I uh, 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 attend the international uh, education forum, especially the one that is held in January in London, and I, I attended that three, four times, and I met over 100 ministers of education attend this across the world. You find that we have very similar problems, very similar problems, even with the, the countries with a strong educational system. Uh, so again, it's a matter of uh, how to handle these problems and implementation of handling these problems. But, um, thank you. Um, uh, the, uh, actually, I gave in the morning, in, in my speech in the morning, some statistics uh, uh, about our higher education system. Uh, one of them is, uh, uh, and that's, uh, you know, documented in the World Economic Forum report of 2014, uh, that uh, our uh, math and uh, science in, uh, in higher education ranks four out of 144. So only preceded by uh, Finland, Belgium, Singapore. So uh, we have a strong education system. That's, that's one of our strengths in, in Lebanon. Um, but uh, you cannot just 
sleep. You know, you, you have to stay abreast of state-of-the-art education is changing very quickly across the world, and you have to stay abreast, otherwise you lag behind. Um, uh, the, the board I suggested, which is the uh, draft law I submitted for uh, establishing a board for uh, uh, quality assurance in higher education, the intention of that was to um, uh, allow all higher education institutions in Lebanon, which are about 46 now, um, to uh, force them to get institutional and program accreditation from international bodies. So uh, if they do that, then that's fine. If they don't, then they have to close. But uh, again, you know, you, you're a minister for a certain period of time, and the next one has to follow through. It doesn't always happen. So um, it, it, uh, it takes time, you know. And, uh, but the, certainly uh, our education system up till now is still the best in the, in the region. And uh, we pride ourselves in, I mean, the American University of Beirut ranks, according to QS ranking, is number 250 in the world. Um, and um, as far as I know, the top 500 in the US alone are excellent. So 250 in the world is something. Um, and there are other good universities in, in the region, but, uh, but very few. We have about 1,000 uh, universities in the MENA region but uh, probably the really good ones are about 20, 25. Next. Can you pass your microphone to? Um, hello, uh, my name is Yara Mwalla and I'm from Syria. Um, my question is about, uh, you said it's like 70% of the students uh, did their education in the private sector, and it's almost the opposite of the rest of the world somehow. So why, why is this high level of the private sector in the schooling system, education system? And how do they collaborate? Like, what's the dynamics between the private and the public sector in terms of education? And I just have one thing um, referring to, uh, to what you said about how the new uh, system, the interreligious, intercultural uh, messages that are, have been embod uh, embodied in, within the new curricula. Um, my fear is sometimes when we prepare a generation for a great uh, level of, um, of a dialogue and a new, uh, very nice values, if the whole system doesn't empower them, that would make them a little bit irrelevant. And that might also explain a little bit why uh, the, the Lebanese youth are always traveling outside Lebanon. That explains why they are 4 million in Lebanon and 20 million. Out. I, I'm not sure about it, but um, I just uh, felt that the comment about uh, yeah. this. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, uh, no, the, the reason why there are so many Lebanese outside Lebanon uh, has nothing to do with that. Uh, uh, immigration from Lebanon uh, started 200 years ago, you know, uh, for different reasons. For economic reasons, for famine reasons, uh, for uh, uh, war reasons. Uh, so um, a lot of them used to go on the ship westwards and end up in Brazil. They thought that this is the United States or end up in Cuba or end up in... Uh, this is how families uh, used to travel. Uh, a lot of sto I've heard a lot of stories like that, but uh, uh, the, the immigration is for a different reason. Um, um, usually those that, I mean, most of those immigrants were not youth, uh, you know, but we do have a brain drain, that's true. And the brain drain is due to the fact that we don't have, uh, you know, uh, uh, enough uh, employment opportunities. And when we do, it's not of the scale that is needed to have a relatively comfortable life. So um, this is why you find almost half a million Lebanese in the Gulf. Um, and this is why there are a lot of Lebanese in the US, in Australia, in, uh, in Europe, and so on. It's really a combination of, uh, of factors. But uh, the 70% figure, uh, yes, uh, I mean, if you look uh, across the region, most of the education, whether we're talking about basic education, uh, the 70% refers to basic education. Um, so um, we have a million students in the K-12, 
and 700,000 are in private uh, schools. Uh, 300,000 are in public schools. Um, usually, um, in countries in the region and also in, uh, in Europe, in the States, all over, um, maybe 80 or 90 percent of the student body are in uh, the public uh, sector. But um, they are in the public sector in Europe and the States because there are good public schools. And they are in the public sector in the region because there's no other option for different reasons. So uh, what probably saved uh, the K-12 education system in Lebanon is the fact that there's a large percentage of uh, students in the private sector. That does not mean all schools, all private schools are good. There's a large spectrum from very bad to excellent. The same for the public schools. There's a very large spectrum from very bad to excellent. In fact, if you look at the back exams, baccalaureate exams, which is equivalent to grade 12, you know, you need to pass those to go to university in Lebanon. All Lebanese have to do the back exams. Um, you will find that out of the four tracks, the, you know there are four tracks, uh, out of the four tracks, the, the success rate is higher in, for public schools in two tracks, and success rate is higher for the other two tracks in the private schools. So it balances out. So uh, in Lebanon, people go to public schools because they can't afford private schools, simple as that. Not because they don't have the opportunity to go to uh, private schools. Um, but um, we have some excellent public schools uh, uh, that, that is evident from the uh, results of the exams. What the weaknesses, the major weaknesses in the public sector is, is the pre-high school. So we're talking about the elementary level. There are large weaknesses there. And the reason for that is over the past two decades, uh, a lot of teachers went into the system to teach elementary without a bachelor degree. You know, the requirement today, you have to have a bachelor degree. And for high school, you need a master's degree. And for uh, um, preschool, you need a, a bachelor with a teaching diploma in, in preschool. And for special education, TD, special, and so on. So these are international benchmarks now. This, to change this in Lebanon is close to impossible because, again, everything is politicized. You know, uh, if, you, if you've heard the news, two days ago the current minister was trying to have a, a competition, an, an exam, in order to uh, inject more uh, uh, teachers into the high school uh, level. And there was a, a huge riot against this because those that are on contract wanted to be for them alone. So, uh, 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 you know, uh, it gets politicized. So, um, uh, that, that is a factor, you know, the 70% to some extent helped our educational system to remain on its feet. Um, uh, because uh, um, uh, the public sector requires, it's not that there is no will of the previous ministers to do something about it. It's the fact that you're talking about an education system that requires billions of dollars. You know, and a country like Lebanon that is almost right now 70 billion in debt um, um, is not injecting enough. Uh, I know that the budget of the Ministry of Education and Higher Education is around $1 billion. But 90% or 85% of that are salaries. So there's very room to maneuver, you know, to do new things, uh, infrastructure and so on. There are many schools that, that lack the necessary infrastructure, the basic infrastructure. Um, so there are lots of problems that require, um, uh, you know, uh, spending money on infrastructure, spending money on uh, training uh, uh, and retraining of uh, teachers and administration, and making bold decisions that basically cut out uh, the dead wood, um, because there's a lot of dead wood. Uh, hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, it's true what, what you mentioned. I mean, it's, it's not enough to embed or integrate into the curricula the, the needed material to raise awareness about the importance of intercultural and uh, 
uh, interreligious uh, aspects, it's also very important to practice it. Um, and this is why when I was minister, I encouraged a lot linking um, public schools in Lebanon with schools in Europe and the States. Uh, and there were several projects uh, uh, that proved to be very successful that allowed students on both ends to talk, discuss, uh, do projects together, and, uh, and learn from each other. Um, uh, apprenticeship uh, also is very important. I, I did, with the little money the ministry had for that, I did send several groups of uh, students from several schools uh, to attend um, visits in, in countries in, in Europe as well as in, uh, in, uh, in the region, Egypt and, and what have you, for different reasons. Uh, it could be sports related, it could be uh, culture related, it could be, but when students came back, you know, uh, meeting with different cultures is an eye opener for, uh, I remember when I got uh, the, Dad Prize, Deutscher Akademische Dad, which is equivalent to the Fulbright, Dad. Yeah. I got it in, I think it was 96. And my three children were still young, very young. And um, uh, when I came, I, I brought my family with me. We spent three months. And I can tell you, in three months, it was an eye opener for the children. You know, they see new things, they meet new people, they see things done differently, and so on. So uh, um, uh, uh, interacting with other cultures, I would say it's essential. It should be part of the requirement of graduation of high school to, to at least do one or two visits uh, uh, to, to other schools uh, um, and, and learn uh, uh, what, how a different culture uh, look at things from different perspectives. It, uh, I agree with you, it's, it's very important. Well, I mean, we don't wait for the political uh, system to open up for this. Uh, the private sector is already doing it, whether schools or universities. I know at AUB we have, the American University of Beirut, we have maybe 100 agreements with different universities to facilitate and help students to spend a term, or like you are doing now, a term or a year abroad uh, uh, in, in, in another university. Um, and a lot of them do, you know, and some students come to AUB to spend a term from other universities in the world. So, uh, yes, definitely this is uh, um, a must, but, I mean, it's not required uh, by law for uh, students to do that, but uh, those that do it uh, definitely benefit culturally and beyond that as well in, in many ways, you know. Yes, please. You uh, have laid out uh, a situation where uh, Lebanon is a pretty progressive society in the midst of a lot of reaction. Um, I woke up this morning to a very disturbing uh, report that uh, ISIS has entered uh, Ramadi. Entered? Ramadi. Mm -hmm. In Iraq, just west of... Uh, Baghdad. It would seem to me that uh, given the orientation of ISIS that uh, Lebanon would be a prime target at some point. Now you're not very far away from it. And also, it also occurred to me that we do live in different worlds, so to speak. You've just come from the airport yesterday uh, in a, from a region that is in terrible turmoil, that's at war. And you come here and everything is relatively peaceful. I'd like you to speak to, because if we're talking about education, we also have to talk about current affairs uh, for those pupils and students in Lebanon and throughout the, the region and the world for that matter. So what, what's the prognosis? What, what's, what's the what? Prognosis. What do people, what are people saying? I mean, you know, with, with these people at, literally at the gates of Lebanon, you know, and we all know the violent history that has transpired over the last 30, 40 years in Lebanon. 
I remember when the Marines went to Lebanon. You know, what was that, 58? Maybe? The what? The Marines. The Marines, yes. 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 Right. So we've had this, as long as I've been living, we've had this tumultuous situation. But right now we have another situation that's very volatile and very dangerous. What threat does the war itself confront Lebanon with? And specifically, what threat does ISIS confront Lebanon with? Yeah. Okay, uh, well, it's a very real threat, I mean, uh, that, that the Lebanese are very much aware of. Um, uh, uh, I think uh, I should start by saying uh, we all know that ISIS emanated from a fundamental group, which are the Qaeda, Rabat. This has been mentioned by many religious leaders, uh, including Al Azhar uh, in Egypt, who is supposed to be the you know, reference for Islam in the region. So let's be clear about that first, because the uh, Islamic relig religion is embracing. It is not uh, a religion that uh, propagates death and, and uh, threat and uh, what have you. So I'm sure you're aware, but I feel, you know, the obligation to say that at the very beginning. Um, uh, in, in Islam, just for your information, um, if a Muslim marries a Christian girl and she wants to stay in her religion, he is uh, required to keep her in her religion and to allow her to go to the church. This is how embracing Islam is. I mean, uh, the Jews have been living for thousands of years uh, in the region protected by uh, Islam. So were the Christians. Um, so what they're doing does not represent Islam in, in any way. Um, it is a political movement that was created for political reasons. And uh, uh, I think that's a long story. It requires a, a different uh, presentation. In, in the morning session, I had another presentation. I mentioned in it that Lebanon was occupied by 15 countries, civilizations, groups, you know, uh, over the past 2,000 years. So uh, at the end of the day, uh, the Lebanese rose again. Um, we were occupied by the Ottoman Empire for over 400 years, and then they went. That does not mean that we're waiting for ISIS to come in. Uh, the, the country would definitely um, uh, are prepared for, uh, for a huge battle if, if they do approach. And I don't think there's any Lebanese, uh, sane Lebanese, uh, that uh, is in his mind that would speak for uh, ISIS. So um, uh, um, I, I personally think there's an international uh, uh, decision that Lebanon be kept away of this. So uh, nobody knows. Uh, what has happened over the, th the past three years, nobody could have predicted four, five, six years ago. Um, unfortunately, there are major powers, powers playing. Uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the birth of ISIS so suddenly and in such a major way obviously indicates that there's uh, major powers in play, regional and international, and that billions of dollars are being spent, uh, uh, logistics uh, are being facilitated. Uh, uh, you know, things like that don't happen overnight. Um, my opinion, uh, um, because of the Lebanese social makeup, uh, I don't think the West would allow something like that to happen in Lebanon. Um, having said that, it happened in Iraq and Syria. You know, the, the, most of the Christians were, uh, uh, you know, basically left their home towns and cities and what have you. But uh, um, I, I really don't have an answer for you, except that uh, if it was me, I would certainly fight until death. Uh, and that is the feeling that every Lebanese uh, you know, would have uh, if, if ISIS uh, do come to Lebanon. Um, they don't represent our values. They don't represent our uh, religion. They don't represent our politics. Uh, uh, unfortunately, this is happening in the, in the midst of political turmoil in the region. And Lebanon is not in, on the, 
border of Switzerland. It happens to be uh, in, in the region uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, very strong political uh, waves uh, for the past, uh, at least from 1948, as you all know, since uh, the Palestinian exodus from Israel. And uh, Lebanon was hit very hard, uh, especially in the 1970 Cairo Agreement uh, when the Arabs agreed that Palestinians would uh, keep their uh, artillery and their uh, you know, uh, war machines in the camps. Um, and that was one of the reasons what, that uh, triggered the war in 1975, I guess. So it's a long story, but um, the Lebanese will definitely survive. I can assure you for that. Uh, uh, but the uh, um, situation is difficult. I mean, uh, um, what has happened in the past to Lebanon was probably worse. Uh, so uh, um, uh, I'm optimistic that uh, the wave will pass over the region and uh, things will improve, especially with, um, you know, everything is so interrelated. Uh, our world is connected in so many different ways. So I have no doubt that if uh, the U.S.-Iran agreement uh, is signed in June, that this would make uh, a difference for the region because it's not just about nuclear facilities. It's also about, you know, uh, the role in the region. And um, uh, I guess uh, um, it's a matter of two months uh, to wait and see what will happen. Can cultural diplomacy do anything? Because uh, I think many are saying, you know, when you've got war, when you've got ISIS, when you've got really these serious threats, what can cultural diplomacy possibly do? Uh, our conversation with the ambassador today, he was more optimistic. He said, yes, you know, it is important, but what can cultural diplomacy do to somehow support or assist uh, a complex situation such as Lebanon or, or the surrounding region? Well, cultural diplomacy will not solve all our problems under the sun, but it will certainly facilitate uh, um, when uh, you deal, I mean, I gave uh, as an example of soft diplomacy uh, in the morning uh, lecture, uh, the, the, the U.S., the, the, you know, the P5 plus one and Iran agreement uh, uh, only a few days ago. Um, and uh, uh, I think, uh, I mean, having an agreement, imagine, you know, the wars and the, the problems that have been saved as a, as a result of an agreement like that. Um, the same applies to all sorts of conflicts in Lebanon and the region. Um, so it's, uh, it's important uh, to propagate the culture of uh, soft diplomacy. In order to do that, um, uh, understanding what cultural diplomacy is about is important. This is why um, I trust it's, uh, it's quite uh, important to introduce a program like that, and this is why we're jointly um, going to start a, a certificate and a diploma on cultural diplomacy, hopefully in the near future. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, it, it, is, it is certainly certainly a factor, uh, especially you know, in, in, uh, in for those that are in the diplomatic uh, channels uh, in Lebanon and across the region. Um, because uh, uh, understanding, you know, uh, there are several ways to reach your destination. If you can understand that you can reach this destination, this solution, with uh, minimal, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, negative uh, actions, let's say, then I'm sure people with sense would uh, take that route. I mean, take the Lebanese war as an example. 15 years of war. At the end, they had to sit together in Taif, in Saudi Arabia, all the, all the Lebanese factions, the warring factions, and uh, they wrote an agreement. They agreed the war stopped. They could have done that at the very beginning, you know, and saved 150,000 lives and uh, billions of dollars of infrastructure and what have you. So, uh, yes, I believe it is important, but alone itself is not enough. As I said, it has to uh, be part of our K-12 educational system, we have to, you know, uh, graduate the global citizens in the sense that they understand what the world is about. They understand uh, what is needed to be successful, and they also meet the requirements of uh, the market needs. Uh, um, so, um, 
Uh, can you imagine uh, a leader that doesn't have good communication skills, for example? A leader that doesn't speak languages to communicate with the other? Uh, you know, a leader that uh, doesn't understand dialogue or uh, soft diplomacy? Or These things should be embedded in various ways in our education system, starting from elementary uh, up to the university level. This is what... Uh, the U.S. model of liberal arts education is about. You, know, you, you, you look at bachelor, uh, at BS uh, programs that are three years, 90 credits, uh, at least at AUB this is the case, and this is the case for most U.S. universities. Out of the 90 credits, you have 30 credits that is general education, nothing to do with the major at hand. So those 30 credits are taken by all students at AUB, every single student. And this GE component is supposed to give you the breadth that is needed. You know, uh, I remember when I was an engineer, when I was studying engineering, everything was engineering, engineering, you know, bachelor, master's, B, everything is engineering. Um, uh, yes, you need to be skilled in your subject matter, but you need to interact with people. You need to, in, in today's world, you need so many 21st century, what's referred to as 21st century skills plus because these skills change and mutate very quickly as you go along. Um, and, uh, you know, everybody now, almost everybody that uh, is in an international uh, company has to deal with different cultures, different nationalities, different ethnicities, different religions. So you have to understand dialogue, you have to understand soft diplomacy, you have to understand, you know, uh, how to deal with uh, uh, the other, the different person. And as such, uh, concepts of uh, coexistence, mutual respect, uh, you know, and uh, you, you, start, you should start to realize that your own perspective of things are not, is not necessarily the ultimate truth, you know, that there are other ideas that uh, are just as valid and maybe more valid. So yes, I, I believe that uh, it is an important component, but uh, alone it's, it's not enough. Uh, it has to be part of a much... Uh, bigger uh, picture to, to address the needs of, uh, of uh, graduates from our educational systems.